Okay, note set number nine. After a string of a few quite long videos, we now have one that will be fairly short. Um, nice, succinct discussion of the Fourier series spectrum. Now we're starting to get into the ideas of how engineers think about signals um, in this so-called frequency domain. This idea of thinking of a signal as being made up out of different frequency components. Each of those sinusoidal terms in a Fourier series we think of as a different component and each one is at a different frequency and that leads us to this idea of a spectrum. The spectrum says um, um, you know how our signal is decomposed across frequencies. So let's think about this trig form spectrum. Uh, since it goes from k equal 1 to infinity, these things here are all positive. Um, so we will call this a single-sided spectrum. Uh, and this viewpoint, this form for the Fourier series and this view of the spectrum is good for thinking about real-world ideas. We think about um, real-world signals as being made up out of a bunch of different positive frequency components, each one having a different amplitude and phase at its specific frequency. Um, so that idea can be shown graphically, and that's the whole point of these spectrums, uh, or spectra, uh, is to be able to visualize these Fourier series coefficients. So we just make a plot of the amplitudes and the phases versus frequency. Uh, and so the frequencies that we're talking about are discrete, so it's going to be a stem plot. So we just, at for k equal to 0, we're at omega equal to 0, and we put a, a, whatever our a sub 0 is. a sub 1 is going to be at 1 times omega 0, so at omega 0 we put a plot there, a point there for um, our a sub 1. A sub 2 is at 2 omega 0, A sub 3 at 3 omega 0, and so on, and so on, and so on. Um, and the dot, dot, dot here shows that this really, in theory, goes on forever. Obviously, I can't show it going on forever, but I can imply that. Now, as alluded to earlier, notice that these things are going downwards. Um, now, they may fluctuate up and down, up and down, up and down, but the general trend will be down to nothingness as k goes to infinity. Um, and we'll soon see why that is. Now, the phase spectrum, same kind of thing. Um, our theta sub k uh, is um, irrelevant since we don't, we just have, or our theta sub 0 is irrelevant. We just have an a sub 0. Most people will put a 0 there just for completeness. Um, but really, you're OK not putting anything there um, if, if you want. And then we just put theta sub 1, theta sub 2, theta sub 3, theta sub 4. Now, some books will plot this versus k. I like to plot it versus omega. Um, if they were to plot it versus k, you'd have a 1 here and no omega 0. You'd have a 2, you'd have a 3, you'd have a 4. That leaves it ambiguous as to where in the frequency it really is. So I prefer to plot it versus omega um, and then show the 2 omega 0, 3 omega 0, 4 omega 0, and so on. So these two plots together make up the complete spectrum. Um, but individually, they're called the amplitude spectrum and the phase spectrum. Um, so, um, and again, and since these things go only over the positive frequencies, um, we call this a single-sided spectrum. We'll see in just a little bit that the complex exponential form has both positive and negative frequencies, so there'll be stuff over on this side as well, and we'll call that, surprisingly, double-sided spectrum. Again, each of the three forms of the Fourier series tells the same story, just a little different narrative. Um, same thing with the actual plots of the spectrum. Um, double-sided, single-sided, they both tell the same story, just with slightly different um, dialogue. So here's the exponential form of the spectrum. Um, and again, we see that k goes over negative and positive values. So um, 
So that's where the double-sidedness comes from. Um, now, it looks like we've only got one thing to plot, C's, C sub K, so whereas previously we had amplitudes and phase, two things. But unfortunately, the C sub K's are complex valued. So um, there's two things that we have to plot the magnitude of that complex number and the phase or angle of each complex number. So here I'm just showing how um, the C sub K gets broken down into its magnitude and its phase um, and so those are the things that we need to plot the magnitude and the angle. Um, so it's really not that different from uh, the uh, amplitude phase form but we're doing it double-sided now. Um, and so again we would just plot these. This is uh, the magnitude of C sub 1. Where's my ink? There we go. Magnitude of C sub 1, magnitude of C sub 2, magnitude of minus uh, C sub minus 1, magnitude of C sub minus 2, etc. And the corresponding angles. Um, the angle of C sub 1, angle of C sub minus 1, and, and so on. A uh, couple things that we can note here. Um, well, aside from it being double-sided, back up here, a couple things that we can note. Notice that the magnitude spectrum has even symmetry and the phase spectrum has odd symmetry. That's true whenever the signal we're expanding is real valued. If the signal we're expanding is complex valued, that does not hold but most of what we'll be expanding will be real valued signals so you can always kind of look at that as a sanity check. Um, now there's no spectrum for the um, sine cosine form because uh, that doesn't really um, show us too much so um, but let's talk a little bit about some spectrum characteristics um, so with the trig form, amplitude and phase, um, the trig form we've seen, single-sided spectrum. The A sub K are all plotted as positive numbers um, but uh, for K greater than zero, but the A sub zero is positive or negative. Um, the theta sub K's are plotted in radians. Um, so we could keep them between minus pi and pi if we want, but sometimes you let them, uh, you know, uh, expand outside that range. But, you know, remember for angles, any angle can be uh, wrapped back to minus pi to pi. And then, as we mentioned already, the theta sub zero, even though there isn't one, um, we usually plot it as um, equal to zero. Um, and then... For the exponential form, uh, we have this idea of a double-sided spectrum. Uh, we have even symmetry for the magnitude spectrum. Uh, the angle is always plotted in radians. Don't ever plot it in degrees. Um, just yeah. um, The angle of C sub 0 is 0 or plus or minus pi. Um, C sub 0 can be a... a um, will be real valued but it'll be either positive or negative so if it's um, if it's um, if it's um, po positive then it's going to be zero if it's negative then we can plot it as either plus or minus pi since those are exactly the same places um, and uh, the phase will always have um, odd symmetry, uh, at least for real valued signals, which is what we're talking about here. And the relationship between the A sub K's shown on the single sided and the C magnitude C sub K's um, follow from these, and we can see that there's a one half relationship. Um, so it's very easy to convert one sided spectrum to a double sided spectrum by using these formulas. Now we get into something uh, that's very important, it's called Parseval's Theorem. Uh, despite the fact that it's a nasty sounding theorem, it's something very useful um, in thinking about uh, real world scenarios. Um, so we've seen earlier how to compute the power, the average power of a periodic signal. We square it, we integrate it over one period, and we divide by the period. 
um, that gives us the average power um, per period or just the average power of the of this periodic signal now suppose we have access to the spectrum but not the signal can we compute the average power from this frequency domain model um, meaning the Fourier series coefficients let's pause for a minute this is a big idea we can now say I can think about the signal as a function of time or I can think about the signal with a new math model just simply tell me what the C sub K's are also tell me what the omega sub zero is once you tell me all that I know everything there is to know about that signal just from this so-called frequency domain model and then looking at how it's plotted versus omega tells me an awful lot about where the signal is concentrated in frequency are there certain frequencies that are larger or stronger than other ones um, so that's this whole idea of frequency domain model now we know how to compute the power from the time domain model how can we compute it from the frequency domain model fortunately Parseval's theorem tells us how to do this again not proving it but Parseval's theorem says that the power is equal to the sum of the squares of the magnitudes of these exponential form Fourier series coefficients so it looks like we've made our life harder we only have to integral or integrate over a finite range but now we have to sum over an infinite range um, it looks like we've made things a little bit harder but actually this form provides a lot of insight and remember we've been talking about how the magnitudes of the C sub K's decay as we go to uh, the extremes of this sum large positive and large negative K values so there's going to be a point where um, the additional terms added in are negligible so then we can truncate this at a reasonable amount and find the power um, so this is a very powerful idea and we can equate these two things uh, and s that's really the statement of Parseval's theorem that this integral gives the power and it's equal to that sum which also gives the power but really this is the big idea we can find the power by squaring the magnitudes of the Fourier series coefficients and adding them up big big idea now clearly we we see that in order for this thing to be finite we're adding up a bunch of positive things these things have to decay down um, in order for that to be finite so for real-world signals we know from this viewpoint they're going that's going to be finite finite power this thing then has to be finite that tells us that the spectrum the magnitude spectrum has to eventually die out as we go um, from uh, out towards the the extremes um, extreme positive and, and extreme negative <clears throat> so interpreting this uh, just uh, formalizing some of the things that we've we've said already um, this is like a sum of squares in the time domain I put sum in quotes integrals are like sums just overheated sums um, so whether we sum in the frequency domain or sum in the time domain uh, we square in both cases and and essentially add up the contributions so here we're adding up the contributions at each individual time here we're adding up the contributions at each individual frequency um, so that's a nice viewpoint uh, just keep in mind that this tells us the power at the frequency k omega zero and it includes the effect at all times so that's a really nice insight so here's a use for Parseval's theorem um, when we're computing that Fourier series approximation that we looked at in the previous lecture uh, Parseval's theorem PT allows us to compute the power of the error so first we can find the average power doing this we can do that analytically we can do that numerically either way um, then for our given our, our used value of capital K we can take our computed Fourier series coefficients and and do this sum and I've just rewritten it this way um, exploiting the fact that the magnitude of C sub 1 
and the magnitude of C sub minus 1 are the same, right? Even symmetry, so I can exploit the even symmetry and just add up the even uh, or the positive frequency ones and multiply by 2 and then pull the DC one out in front. So either of those forms is fine. Oh, whoops, got ahead of myself there. Um, so then we can find we've got a, a, a pretty close version. Uh, you know, if we did it numerically, we have to make sure that we've done that numerical integration uh, precisely. But we've got P, we've got the power that is in our approximation. We've lost some power because we've left out the terms above K and below minus K. And so this is going to tell us this error is how much power there is in the terms that we left out. But we don't have to compute it this way, which would be impossible. Instead, we compute this, we compute this this way, both of those are computable, subtract that, and if that error is small, then we know that we've made k big enough. And so that's the basic idea. Um, and this picture is just showing um, you know, how these things decay, and, and this is plotting them squared, and so eventually these things get small enough that um, we can truncate this. Um, okay, we'll see more about Fourier series and, and its uh, extensions to Fourier transforms as we go further into the course. Thanks.